Hey, good morning, guys. All right, so we're going to continue on with the psychopath. As a psychiatrist, I'm going to take two minutes to just give you all a little backstory of why it's so important for us to start paying attention to our mental health. And when we're seeking out mental health professionals that we are aware of their background, of what their expertise or their field of study is, if you want to stop drinking and doing narcotics, you're more likely going to find a behavioral or cognitive behavioral therapist because it's dealing with the cognitions of your mind. So he's going to take you through techniques on how to view your behaviors. Uh, but if you want a more of a psychosocial or a psycho-spiritual connection to connecting that, that could be somebody else that you can be dealing with in combination with the CBT therapist. But don't assume that all social workers, all psychologists have the same field or expertise or the cultural awareness of understanding you as a gay, trans, Muslim, Hindi person who's trans and just have a bunch of cultural things going on that you think that that white person might not understand. I'm just using them as a reference because I found psychopathy existing in these white professionals who post up in our communities. Um, and they offer in their services, but do we ever see anybody going into their offices that look like us in the community? As we're still seeing all these mental illnesses and feeble mindedness and popper, popperism, criminality. What are they really helping? What kind of insurance are they off, off, uh, accepting? And why is the copay so high? Uh, and why don't I feel wel a welcoming in this office as I'm sitting in the lobby being ignored? And when they finally say hello to you, can I help you? What do you think I'm in here for, honey? For my health? So now the crazy got to come out. <laughs> so to avoid all of this, because it can be quite condescending and intimidating when you're dealing with psychopaths that are pretending to be helping in the mental health field in your communities. It can be very angry to why they're there when you see that they're not helping you. They're there because it's that, that narcissism uh, also didn't want to pay a high lot fees <laughs> and rent out uh, and be paying monthly a high rent on an office space so they go post up at the cheap neighborhoods where they can get cheap rent um, and they'll rent out a room in one of the lots or whatever and that's why they're there so we know why they're there and then they've been sustained by ignoring you in your communities and i guess their presence is making you think that they care <laughs> but what are they actually doing to help they don't even as they're ignoring you and the debris that's outside the office. <laughs> yeah, it's all psychopathy. And we wanna root this out by having a little bit of understanding of them now. So that we can go in and just figure out what is the fallacy of these mental health professionals and why they've neglected their duties in ensuring mental soundness in our societies. Um, and they have no presence anymore unless we have a copay right and insurance and you don't even see these people i've been helped by so many psychologists and psychiatrists who took up a personal uh position to have a, a vendetta against me uh to have animosity against me to be working clandestinely behind my back and against me to keep me with anxieties and, and keep my depression sustained as I'm walking out of their office, feeling like I never got any help and wanting to drink after I leave their office. And I didn't realize that after all this time of never getting help from these psychologists, that this was all witchcraft that they were sustaining as they're holding their titles and having their art behind their licensed clinical social worker titles. Uh, they go to school for eight years to be, get a PhD in a field knowing that they'll never go back into this community and help the people who are really in need. Y'all don't think that this is a mental health problem? So this guy is going to talk about this psychopathy and the psychiatrist 
to why your, your dose is being bumped up to 10 milligrams because you haven't got over your hallucinations, John, after six months. Oh, that's not good. Let's increase this to 25%. But I can't get any sleep, ma'am. Oh, you're not getting any better. She's so concerned, right? No. She's not giving you the right medications because she knows she's just misdiagnosed you. Because she don't really know what the real symptoms of bipolar 2 looks like. As she's not uh, with seeing them in herself. And you got to ask yourself, why is that? Because it's psychopathy. <laughs> I'm about to read it and expose this darkness today. So without further ado, because I wanted to make this video again, we're going to continue on, guys. It's going to take me a good 45 minutes to get through this. I'm going to try to take my time, okay? And they're not all psychopaths, but they don't want to help. And they're not going to help. And they're going to give you wrong medications. It's guaranteed. Y'all not tired of that? I think you are. I think you do want to get mental health services, but you don't trust these doctors <laughs> rightfully. Fight against this. Don't sit back and fester in all your mental stuff when these people are making 200 k a year to sit back and, <laughs> and give you infallible advice. I'm sorry, fallible advice because it is because it is an error i've noticed the medications have been an error them bumping my doses have been errors and no one has ever been allowed me to like connect to the psycho spiritual properties of what was really ailing me and get help me get to the source of my childhood traumas none of them psychologists helped me in this area Yeah, so I really believe that these people are psychopaths and they just are just having these titles due to self glamorizations and because self exaltation. These titles make them feel normal. It makes them feel like they're not crazy, but they don't really, really understand, have taken in the real true ramifications of it giving valuable information to people that really need help from them and want them to understand them as they have no quote, cultural awareness of your, who you are as a black person, Latin person, Hindi person, gay or trans person. They're going to sit there and pretend like they care so much about you, but it's all going to be fallible, erroneous, uh inauthentic and disingenuous with them as they keep in their straight face uh and they now uh are taking up a lot of the taoisms and meditations and yogas now so that they can regulate physiolo physiologically uh their blood pressures and stuff so now that they're not getting the flush skin and the redness when they're getting when they know they're doing nefarious and they're thinking of clasting ways of keeping you I guess, uh, unbeknownst to what their real malevolent intentions are and unwitting to that as they're looking at you with the straight face, they got to make sure that the blood doesn't raise up of their nefarious intentions so it can throw off the scent that they're actually just giving you valuable and erroneous information um, that's really not helping your problem. So they've managed, I've noticed, to, to work on their blood, to not allow the blood to raise up. Uh, but it's all mimicry, and it doesn't really deal with that real, true anxieties and those psychoneuroses and the pathologies that are festering on these psychologists, psychiatrists who have the titles. They have the intelligence and the money and the privilege to be able to stay in school and not drop out due to having to work and pay bills and stuff. Uh, but now they're out in our fields and our communities with these titles 
and I'm really questioning what their role is in our society as we're still seeing the chaos and the collective anxieties brewing all over the place. Where are these psychologists and psychiatrists? You got to ask yourself. Yeah. They're never going to come together and, and try to step out this darkness because they're working for the kingdom of darkness and evil at this point in the game. And we can only surmise this when we're seeing so much destruction in our world today. And these people are still making more and more money. More and more money. They're paying these people. Y'all not mad about this, are y'all? Y'all don't care. Because y'all like, it's their life. And I don't care about my mental health anyways. But they're affecting the whole society, our communities. Dating culture has been, it's all messed up now. Men are not prepared to be men and fathers anymore. And this is all due to the fact because we don't understand our mental well-being, our mental health. We don't understand what, what to do. And these psychologists know that they can come in and do interactive work community outreach they know that they come out in our communities and pass our brochures and and also change up some policies to offer more health insurances they can do more but they don't do it you gotta ask yourself why is that we got all these books but the people don't have the knowledge you gotta ask yourself questions about what are these real intentions of these psychologists and psychiatrists at this point in the game i think we're dealing with psychopathy all right so clicky did a little study on that, uh, on this psychiatri psychiatrist, and we're going to find out what his real motive and intentions is. Among this class of persons who show deviations in some fundamental respects similar to those presented in the first series, but who make a good or a fair superficial adjustment in society are sometimes found men who hold responsible positions. Lawyers, business executives, physicians, and engineers who show highly suggestive features of the disorder have been personally observed. Perhaps one would think that the psychiatrist with good opportunities to observe the psychopath would askew or shun all his ways. I believe, however, that a glimpse can be given of characteristics of the psychopath in such a person. Now let's, now let's see. Let's take a glimpse into this. Let us first direct our attention to him many years ago when, as an author of some papers on psych psychiatric subjects, have attracted the interest of several inexperienced young physicians then at the beginning of their careers. The article, it is true, were marred of grammatical errors and vulgarities in English, a little disillusioning in view of a suave and pretentious style attempting by the author. At the time, however, they impressed this little group of naive admirers as having all the originality that the author so willingly allowed others to impute to them. And as a matter of fact, implied not to subtly himself, sub subtly himself in every line of his work. When seen later at a small medical meeting at which no experienced psychiatrists were present, this author seemed very grand indeed. The actual ideas expressed in his paper were, to be fair, cold. Cold means selected or chosen from a group, from the primers of psychiatry and psychology. But he had an authoritative way of making them seem entirely his own and marvelous too. Despite his cool and somewhat commanding air, he succeeded in giving an impression of deep modesty. Everything seemed to accentuate his relative youth, which in turn hinted of a precociousness and of great promise. The effect he had on his audience, most of whom were generally practitioners from small towns, was tremendous. An opportunity to meet this splendid figure of psychiatrists psychiatrist and to sit at his feet during the rest of the evening was avidly welcomed by several of the new admirers. <laughs> Dr. 
doctor, though still in the middle 30s, enjoyed a wide and avial, inviolable reputation in the section of the country where psychiatrists were at the time almost unknown. After some work at the hospital in a distant state where he was born, he had come and set up a specialist. I'm sorry, there's a spirit in my room trying to mess my voice up. I'm gonna be trying to be very patient because it's a long chapter and I wanna get through it guys with the most patience. God, can you come in this room and help me get through this chapter please? Thank you. Doctor, though still in the in his in the middle 30s, enjoyed a wide and inviolable reputation in a section of the country where psychiatrists were at the time almost unknown. After some work at hospitals in a distant state where he was born, he had come and set up as a specialist in his present habitat. He soon obtained a small institution in which he began to direct treatment of psychiatric patients. Reports indicate that it flourished and, and expanded greatly. <clears throat> it was genuinely agreed that his learning and abilities were truthfully responsible for his rapid rise to local prominence. Ephemeral rumors hinted that the idolized doctor made a practice of treatment by expensive and doubtful procedures. Any patient of means whom he could obtain for as long as the money lasted and then dismissing him or sending him promptly to a state hospital. It was also heard that with female patients, he sometimes suggested or even insisted on activities which are spe specifically pres prescribed in the Hippocratic Oath. But what physicians has not had similar things said about him? The impressive bearing of the man and his reiterated and rather eloquent appeals for higher scientific consecration on the part of his colleagues snuffed out their feeble sneerings of it, adverse criticisms. Were all. Really, God? You gonna really allow this devil to attack me and make me look like a fool on this camera? Wow, all this praying I did this morning, it's really annoying me, but I'm gonna keep on going. I can't believe this. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. And I know there's a spirit in my room right now. I'm commanding you to go and flee from me, Satan. You're not gonna mess up my video. You're not gonna mess up this chapter. This is a really good chapter. I hate this from happening, guys. I hate this. I can't stop these spirits. <laughs> I can't stop them. They doing what they want. But I got something I want. I got something for that ass right now. Oh yeah. But I think I know what's going on right now. But I'm not going to say it because I don't want this devil to get in me one up on me at all. So I'm going to fight you.
You better go for me, Satan. I'm going to cast you out and I'm going to cast down all the imaginations. I'm casting down the imagination of witchcraft. It ain't got no power over me. Any witchcraft spell, any dark magic, black magic that is being thrown on me, any evil eye that's on me, I rebuke it and I cast it down right now. All imagination and every high thing that exhausts itself against the knowledge of God. And I bring it into captivity. Every thought, all fear, all paranoia, all witchcraft, dark magic, your moon magic, the candle work, your altar work. I, ca I cast down all your altars. I knock down all your altars. You're, back, you're doing your magic and you're looking on my YouTube right now as we speak this devil. I feel your energy on me. Let me tell you something. My answers are going to come for you. I promise you. They're coming for you. I'm re releasing them and dispatching them to you right now as we speak. God, release attacking angels and warden angels or anybody on this YouTube channel. Anybody that's harassing me right now. Come for them right now. Go for them. You're not going to get away with your crime. I promise you this. There's a lot of psychopaths on this YouTube. It's very disheartening. It's very bewildering to, to fight against these forces this morning. It's so unfair. But this is what we got to go through in the spirit right now. But it's okay. You're not going to mess up my video. And you're not going to get no anger out of me because I know you want to get no, you want to try to get your energy supply today. <laughs> but you're not going to get no energy from me. I'm putting all this energy into reading this book to expose this darkness on these psychopaths that's really out here. And if our societies could wake up and come out of their stupor or whatever this is that they're in to, to, to why they're ignoring this and being complicit to psychopaths running the show still when we clearly see what mental illness looks like. No, this is intimidation and fear tactics. And we're going to uproot this evil by casting it down and casting down the imagination and, and the belief systems of fear as well. There's nothing to fear. Whom shall I fear? God is the strength of my life and powerful over all the created. The creator has cre created you. But uh, something happened in nature that deviated, and now you're working for the kingdom of darkness. And I want you to know that just because you're working for the devil didn't mean that the devil created you. And you're going to realize this as your life is being sustained and being tortured by this devil who now wants you to, I guess, sacrifice yourself because you couldn't accomplish your mission of taking me down energetically. Oh, no, you can't take God's people down because we come from the light. When it ever metaphysically has darkness ever taken over light, it doesn't work that way. And it also works in human beings. But so you can't intimidate me with witchcraft. You can throw me off, get me distracted, get me to get off my assignment so I can pay attention to you so you can feel important. But I don't know who you are out here, but I know that your life can't be that well. It can't be that well. It can't be going that well if you will take out your day to get on somebody's channel and go evil eye and dark magic on somebody do you know the karmic ramifications of this god will avenge everything that's going on on this youtube stop doing your witchcraft um that's a warning for you <laughs> please stop doing it all right so we're going to move on now <laughs> i was not expected to do this and this is my second video, and I really thought that I was going to be able to get through this. But, you know, I, I got to recognize I'm a spiritual queen, baby. <laughs> I was born for this. I'm a spiritual assassin. This devil don't stop attacking me everywhere I go, and even on this YouTube. So if I got to stop this reading to attack this devil, then so be it. And if it makes me look crazy, then so be it. Whatever. Say what you want. Gaslight me all you want. It's all spirits. And I want you to know it's all coming back up on you as well. The psychiatrist, the psychopath as a psychiatrist. Oh, I already read that. I'm going to read it all over again now. Among this class of persons who show deviations in some fundamental respects similar to those presented in the first series, but who make a good or a fair superficial adjustment in society are sometimes found men who hold responsible positions. Lawyers, 
executives, business executives, physicians, and engineers who show highly suggestive features of the disorder have been personally observed. Perhaps one would think that the psychiatrist with good opportunities to observe the psychopath would askew all his ways. I believe, however, that a glimpse can be given of characteristics of the psychopath in such a person. Let us first direct our attention to him many years ago when, as an author of some papers on psychiatric subjects, he attracted the interest of several inexperienced young physicians then at the beginning of their careers. The article, it is, it is true, where marred in grammatical errors and vulgarities in English, a little disillusioning in view of the suave and pretentious style attempted by the author. At the time, however, they impressed this little group of naive admirers as having all the originality that the author so willingly allowed others to impute to them. And as a matter of fact, implied not to subtly him, subtly himself in every line of his work. When this, when seen later at a small medical meeting at which no experienced psychiatrists were present, this author seemed very grand indeed. The actual idea expressed in his papers were, to a fair, to be fair, selected from the primary primers of psychiatry and psychology, but he had an authoritative, authoritative way of making them entirely his own and marvelous too. Despite his cool and somewhat commanding air, he succeeded in giving an impression of deep modesty. Everything seemed to accentuate his relative youth, which in turn hinted of precociousness and of a great promise. The effect he had on his audience, most of whom were general practitioners from small towns, was tremendous. An opportunity to meet this splendid figure of a psychi psychiatrist and to sit at his feet during the rest of the evening was avidly welcomed by several of his new admirers. Doctor, though still in the, in the middle 30s, enjoyed a wide and inviolable reputation in a section of the country where psychiatrists were at the time almost unknown. After some work at hospitals in a distant state where he was born, he had come to set up a specialist in his present habitat. He soon obtained a small institution in which he began to direct treatment of psychiatric patients. Reports indicate that it flourished and expanded greatly. It was generally agreed that his learning and abilities were chiefly responsible for his rapid rise in local prominence. Ephemeral, ephemeral rumors hinted that the idolized doctor made a practice of treating an expensive and doubtful procedures any patient of means whom he could obtain for as long as the money lasted and then dismissing him or sending him promptly to a state hospital. It was also heard that with female patients, he sometimes suggested or even insisted on activities as therapy, which are specifically proscribed in the Hippocratic Oath, but what physicians had not had similar things said about him. The impressive bearing of the man and his uh, reiterated and rather eloquent appeal for higher scientific consecration on the part of his colleagues snuffed out these feeble steerings of adverse criticisms, which were almost universally ascribed to jealousy. The lion of the evening seemed to put himself out in being gracious to his young admirers, who were indeed nobodies on the fringe of a wonderful field which he seemed to dominate. His good fellows was so heartily yet so suave that one could scarcely bring himself to see the faint underlining note of condescension. The privilege of driving this relatively great personage out to a country place where hospitality beckoned was seized by one of the young phys physicians. In the car, an attempt was made to turn the conversation to psychiatric questions which Dr. had raised in his papers. He made a few stilted replies, but soon drifted from the subject into talk that was hardly more than pompous gossip. His companion, fearing that such a learned man might be talking down to spare him the embarrassments of incomprehension, kept returning to psychiatry, trying to make it plain that no such embarrassment would dis discount the pleasures of hearing the master. Soon the replies of this admitted master left the young man in, in serious doubt, not only as a great one's knowledge, but even at, 
as to its interest in the subject. Doctor, in his more popular talks and articles, as well as occasionally in those directed toward rustic medical groups, often gave psychiatric interpretations of literature and art. One of his more recent efforts in this line touched briefly but ambitiously on the work of Marcel Proust, being then in the middle of an earnest pilgrimage among the psychopathologic wonders of remembrance of a thing past. The fledgling psychiatrist, hoping to make a good impression, we fear but also eager for enlightenment, ventured to questions on this subject. The master at this time was calm and alert, but his remarks were so beside the point that, that he that that his despicable disciple wavered. Doctor was perfectly self-assured. In fact, politely pontifical, pontifical, whatever that word means. But the more he talked, the clearer it became that he had not read the book at all. It finally became equally clear that even Proust's name was unfamiliar and the disquieting suspicion dawned on his admirers that he had never encountered it except in the expert excerpts from some review which he had apparently come upon and used. He had not been sufficiently interested in what he had plagiarized even to retain the name and was now imputing it to some imaginary Venice, uh, Venice psychiatrist. He followed this pretension only for a moment, however, and only as a stepping stone to ban banalities with which he was familiar and about which he spoke with such deliberation and assurance that they almost seemed marvelous. Never in all this persiflage, persiflage means frivolous battering talk, did he show the least sign of confusion and timidity. Apparently, he felt that he had kept intact his impressive front. Even at this stage of the acquaintanceship, it was hard to avoid suspicion that any important distinction between such a front and more substantial things was not in the orbit of his awareness. With some remarks about putting aside these grave and ponderous subjects, he sang a few lines of the surprisingly obscene Diddy clapped. Diddy clapped his companion on the back and suggested with gusto, end quote, when their social things are over, <laughs> when their social doings are over, let's you and I go get up a couple of good frisky chippies, end quote. Despite the conv conviviality implicit in this remark, and no less in his tone, he still, in some way hard to describe, maintain the attitude of one who means to insist on his distinct superiorities, even while for a moment generously waiving certain restrictions of caste and allowing his companion to a more respectable footing. It was only a quasi quality that he offered, however, an indulgence such in an adult might allow a child who on some special occasion is permitted to sit up and play with his play that he has grown. The friendship he seemed to offer was at best a morganetic one. Morganetic means a marriage between a member of a royal or a noble family. So hypergamous or something like this, he's trying to say. So a person of a noble rank marrying somebody of an inferior rank, that's a hypergamous relationship. So, but he used the word morganetic. His discourage during the rest of the drive, especially after he had stopped on the way of a couple of quick ones was coarse and humorless. It seemed impossible to strike a sincere idea from him on any subject. On arriving at the host's place, a merry but entirely civilized company was found drinking highballs, singing around the piano, or talking enthusiastically in small groups. The singing was in key, and the talking not loose or aimless. For the most part, for the most part of the gathering was composed of people who, though lively, had some interest in general ideas, as contrasted with the trivia of daily life. 
and a few slowly ingested drinks brought out humorous and interesting conversations. The house was not very large or the furnishings spectacular, but, but the place, like the men and women present, gave a strong impression to the newcomer that he was in orderly surroundings among people of dignity and goodwill. A young, very good looking married woman who had an amateur but genuine interest in psych psychiatric questions and who went who meant to be polite to the distinguished stranger began talking to him with enthusiasm. He soon led her off into another room. A moment later on passing through this room, one of the young physicians was hailed by a feminine voice and responded found to in a nook. The lady pulled herself away from the doctor with some efforts, but with equanimity, soundness of mind. So she kind of politely kind of eased off of him. It was plain that his cruel and crudely, crudely aggressive overtures were not welcome to her. And she urges the other man who was an old friend to join them on the Davenport. Eventually, trying to start a conversation, she asked the celebrity about the psychoanalysis, a subject which he sometimes expounded to lay gatherings in such a way as to give the erroneous impression that he was a qualified analyst. How can he not think that he's going to be questioned at all as he's holding this title? In quote, if I could get you out in the car, I'd, I'd psychoanalyze you right now, end quote, he muttered, low but loud enough to be overheard, accompanying his words with a confident leer. The savant had evidently misread the spirit of the party. The lady rose, smiled quickly at her other companion as if to say she knew a disagreeable fellow when she saw one and quietly, quietly rejoined the group. Doctor now expressed a desire for straight liquor, making strong derogatory remarks about highballs and those who drank them. Ordering his former disciple to come, he strolled toward the kitchen. The former disciple, by this time feeling heavily responsible for the master, made haste to follow in the kitchen doctor, began to order the savant about his profane and pestilent fashion. So, All right. In the kitchen, doctor began to order the savant about to, in profane and petulant fashion, he had gulped one or two small whiskeys when several men wandered in looking for ice. One of these, an eager intern, expressed interest in the important investigative work which doctor had begun now, in loud, boastful tones, to announce himself engaged in. He says, in quote, if you want a job there, son, just let me know. He thundered. Swaggering about, he made an all-embracing gesture. Then he continued, at the Institute, I'm it. I'm the big cheese, I tell you. No one saw fit to dispute these claims. He began then a tirade on the subject of his executive ability his scientific standing, his knowledge of the stock market, his sexual powers, and his political influence. Having delivered himself of this, he pushed his audience aside and soldered back into the sitting room. There he recognized an old acquaintance, a physician who had formerly been on the resident staff with him at some hospital, but in an inferior capacity. This man, a newcomer, was talking with the hostess in the midst of a small group of men and women <laughs> Why the old son of a bitch, doctor shouted. Come on here and sit your goddamn ass in this chair and talk to your chief, <laughs> end quote. It was no time for vacillation. The newcomer and the young physician who had accompanied doctor to the party caught each other's eye and quickly hurried the celebrity to the door. He pulled back at first, but soon came along satisfactorily at as both companions sought so earnestly to casual him that the words of each were lost to the other. Turning to his companions just as the door was gained, he shouted, Chippies, did you say? On the way to his hotel, he began to protest. He was by no means confused from drink. 
be goddamn if I go there. What kind of dirty bastards are you anyways? He became insistent, nay, even defiant about going where he could obtain women. The new members of the party who had seen him through many such episodes and who, to the other escorts' relief, kindly assumed charge of the case, advised that he be hurried, uh, be humored. Doctor himself threw an arabescence of obscene threats, muttered directions to the driver. Expecting to find an ordinary brothel, both of his companions were surprised to arrive at a large outdoor pavilion where an orderly dance was going on. Before a definite decision could be reached about what to do, Doctor was out of the car. Look, look, he yelled imperiously. A pleasant looking man appeared. You've got to get up that good piece of tea and get it quick, boy. I guess he was meaning titties. You've got to Get us a good pair of titties and get it quick, boy, <laughs> he ordered. Well, wait here and watch him dance by. The man called Luke, so far as could be learned, was under serious obligation to the doctor and apparently meant to obey him. He confided that he had stood by his friend and benefactor in, such, in many such sprees in, in this town. Luke had pleasant manners and was not drinking. God at once. Savant muttered, what in, can you get that slut out of here, Luke? He was far enough away <laughs> not to be overheard by the dancers. Luke smiled and shook his head. There is one, the doctor commented again with enthusiasm. She's rutting, that one's rutting. I can tell it. He's remar he remarked, which, which followed can hardly be suggested even in writing on medical subjects. His two companions left him now in custody of Luke with instructions that he be brought back in the car when he was when it was possible without violence. Luke had asked not to. Luke had, Luke had asked not to be left with sole responsibility. Sometime later, the doctor returned. It was difficult to judge whether or not he had gained all the satisfaction he sought. He made it plain that he had found a companion, but despite his boastful garrulousness, did not fought. Garrulousness means given to the rambling or tedious, pointless or annoying talkativeness. Did not give the final details of the encounter. In view of his windy frankness, this caused doubt as to how he had succeeded in his aims. Beyond question, he had made considerable progress. He announced this much loudly, holding up a finger, finger, sniffing it as he did so, and making a comment of such ingenious distastefulness that even his brother physicians blenched. A new discipline could not be ruminate, ruminate about what appraisal of women and of human relations, what attitudes toward basic goals prevailed beneath this successful man's ordinary impressive exterior. On the road back to his hotel, he cursed tru truculently at others' cars. He came in willingly while going on into the elevator. He pinched the buttocks of a Negro girl who ran the machine, apparently oblivious of several passengers. There was no gaiety or or human touch in this action, only a sullen derogatory aggressiveness. He uttered vague challenges and threats, emphasizing his combative prowess and his readiness to fight anyone who might take issue with him on any question. On entering his room, he immediately made for a whiskey bottle and began calling raucously, raucous, raucously for ice. He began loud and offensive when his companions sought to excuse themselves, banged the table with his fists and ordered grandiosity to fight and to fight at once. He was a tall, powerful man and by no means too drunk to put on a lively and embarrassing scene of, if crossed. Take a break. Let's take a break. We don't have to keep continuing.
He cursed the belly boy who had arrived meanwhile with such vile oaths that it was marvelous that he took them. Pouring himself a quick drink, he called for careful attention from his companions. Had he told them about his children? No, they must see pictures of them. He began to praise them extravagantly to extol his love for them and his in sickening terms of pathos or pseudo pathos. He spoke of his plans for their future. His entire manner began to change, and it was plain that he had determined notions about keeping all of his children, or what he called, pure. A surprisingly moralistic aspect of the psychiatric psychiatrist began to appear. Cheap expressions of sentimentality fairly gushed from him. He recited in a loosely emotional strain rhymes by Edgar A. Gus about the little ones. Then he momentarily broke down and bluttered. Tears ran down his cheek. The belly boy had brought ice and... The belly boy had brought ice and doctor insisted on pouring out drinks, swaggering about now in his earlier, earlier manner. When his companion insisted on leaving, he promptly announced that he would accompany them. He cannot be persuaded to go to bed and quickly became overbearing when persuaded. persuasion continued. Though he had, of course, taken a good deal of whiskey, he seemed to know perfectly what he was doing. He did not, in fact, really seem drunk in the ordinary sense of the word. Both of his companions felt that he was not a person irresponsible for the moment who must be protected and prevented from doing things he would regret. On the contrary, one was strongly impressed that this was the man himself. Going down on the elevator, he renewed his practice on the police polite Negro girl, becoming so annoying to her that his companions had to interfere. He called a taxi and insisted that all proceed, proceed at once to a brothel having had enough experience for one night in trying to be their brothel's keeper, his companions were obdurate. He drove off, cursing them viciously as disgraceful specimens of humanity and making derogatory remarks about their virility. What's the matter with him? asked the younger. Just a queer fellow that way, replied the one who knew him well. He's cool and calculating, a good executive and a rather pleasant man superficially during the week, though always a little arrogant. Even when on the job, he's not to be trusted. Every time he gets a chance, he does just about what you've seen him do tonight. He keeps under wraps of outer dignity at the hospital, and he's careful not to take them off under circumstances which would cause him to get in serious trouble. He passes as a great gentleman, impolite, but unsophisticated circles at home. But the cloak must be very uncomfortable. Almost every week he ends, week in, he makes an opportunity to get it off. And he's always then just the man you saw tonight. But won't his reputation suffer from what he's doing tonight? Probably not. He is a long way from home since the town he he is from is small. He evidently assumes that all the people he was thrown with tonight were a country buckets who don't count for much and who would be overawed by him. He judges people only by superficial appearances of wealth and power, and he is seldom impressed except by gaudy display. He kept up a good front at the medical meeting. He is exceedingly shrewd according to his light about lights about where he and when he behaves naturally. At home, he often goes off into swamps with groups of men far beneath him in his own estimation and who are apparently flattered to be chosen. The trips are ostensibly to catch catfish or in the winter to shoot ducks, but actually it's merely to get rowdily drunk. 
boast and shout inanely and sprawl about on the grounds or in muddy boats around the camp. He wasn't drunk tonight, but in the swamp, he often passes through these obscene, bluttering phases in an hour or two and reaches the sodden state that one might expect in his goal. Sometimes he wants a woman. It doesn't matter what woman or under what circumstances. Some of the people who know him say that he prefers low, unprepopet. I'm sorry, guys. Some of the people who know him say that he prefers low, unprepossessing partners. And especially illiterate Negroes. This is what he's preferring. But it has always seemed to me that there was no preference at all. And I've seen him often. A beautiful woman means no more to him than an imbecilic harlot. But on the other hand, the harlot means no more than the beautiful woman. Sometimes when the idea of sex is staring him, he gets to drink to he gets too drunk to make him God, what is this? Why, why, why? You know, yeah, I can keep going. Sometimes when the idea of sex is stirring him to get too gets let me do it again. <laughs> Sometimes when the idea of sex is stirring him to get... All right, let me do it again. Sometimes when the idea of sex is stirring him, he gets too drunk to make much of his opportunities. I'll never forget one incident. He was about daybreak down in the swamps where we'd been fishing. He'd gone out on a sexual mission pretty drunk. We found him at a white wash shack. It was time to leave for, him, for home, so another fellow and I rolled him off a fat Negro washerwoman. She must have weighed 200 pounds. Sex, 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 boss, she muttered. He's far gone this time. Ain't done nothing yet. It was my last fishing trip with him. The next morning, with fresh sunlight streaming into the hotel, the youngest member of the group, having finished breakfast, met Doctor in the lobby. I can't believe that this book, this chapter got messed up. I was not anticipating that. And I don't want to mess up the rest of this chapter. So I'm going to just going to stop and take a break. Okay, guys. Um, there's some type of magic that's being pulled on me to make me lazy. Uh, I know what's going on. I'm just trying to put it out there, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to get my energy back up and I'm going to try to do this, do the rest of this chapter. But I'm just, just going to. Um, but it's not going to control me. And I my belief today is that it is not going to control me. Actually, that is my belief. It's not going to control me. So I'm going to continue on. <laughs> Screw this devil. <laughs> you ain't going to stop me. And it don't matter how slow I got to read this. I'm going to get this chapter done in one video. You want to watch? You want to watch me? Do whatever you want to do. Do whatever magic you want to do. But I'm not going to stop. I promise you that. The next morning, with fresh sunlight streaming into the hotel, the youngest member of the group, having finished breakfast, met Doctor in the lobby. He was emerging from a telephone booth, tall, self-assured, clear-eyed, neat as a dandy, fashionably dressed, he looked the fine figure of a man. He spoke affably. With a disarming, boyish smile, he made some references to the previous evening. His polite expressions and poised tone made clear the implication that he had been on a pleasant occasion and had cemented friendships. The inconspicuous trace of condescension first noted on meeting him was now more obvious, but this somehow tended to make 
his cordiality seemed more previous, precious. He was as sober as a man can be and showed no signs of a hangover. Indeed, as his other companions of the night had said, he must have been drinking very moderately. The former admirer of Dr. Who was an old friend of a lady whom had offered to psychoanalyze in a parked car the night before stopped at her house later in the day to say goodbye before leaving the city come in i must speak to you she said there was a there was some indignation in her tone but more mischief and merriment about what about your friend the famous psychoanalyst she said relishing in all friendliness the other discomfiture she was a person of some sophistication and poise being also pretty vital and desirable to men she knew well how to take care of herself in the ordinary company she had been married for several years and gave a strong impression of being happy and in love with her husband well she continued, I must tell you, you are interested in queer people. At about 10.30 this morning, the cook came and woke me up. It's the telephone, she said. Damn that telephone, Lou, I told her. Don't you know that I was up to all hours last night? Yes, and she answered, but the gentleman says you'll speak with him and it's important business. I picked up the phone. Good morning, Mary said an unfamiliar, self-assured, masculine voice. I was wondering who it could be, knowing me well enough to use my first name and still so pompous. Then, just as I recognized the voice, Mary, this is doctor. From this tone, you'd have judged he thought I'd to sing for joy. Yes, indeed, I said. He then baldly, baldly, suggested that I make a date with him for this afternoon. He come out for me at 4 p.m. Or better still, he suggested, I could meet him at a tr drug store downtown. Don't start with these hiccups, please. Really? There was something so superior about him, a sort of indescribably cool insolence. Oh, I don't know what about his manner, I mean. And after last night, not just the proposition itself that I fairly turned white with rage. I wanted so much to blast him with scorn that I was at a loss for words. When you get that mad, it's easy to lose your head. The calm and effective expression of indignation by which ladies in Victorian novels squatched insults, it's hard to put into the idioms of today, trying not to make myself unnecessarily ridiculous, but trusting the reply would register as final i said is that so sorry but i'm afraid i'll have to forego that pleasure he then insisted not like a lover or even like one who's making any decent pretense of being a lover but coolly almost arrogantly like a fake gentleman who's after a servant girl I must have succeeded in making myself a little clearer by this time for the resign for he resigned himself about this afternoon but i wasn't done with him he then began to say that he he would be back in the city to city soon probably every very <laughs> He then began to say that he would be back in this city soon, probably every now and then. He liked to see me on some of these occasions. He'd call me when he came. No, perhaps he would be better if he dropped me off a note and let me know when he'd be here. Then I would call him. I was getting so vexed that I scarcely caught the implication that he didn't want to telephone and find George here. For a moment, I couldn't answer, and I suddenly remembered the way he announced himself. Mary, this is doctor. The overwhelming affront to Tory of the whole farce came over me. It was too much, Mary, this is doctor. This priceless ass calling me by my first name and referring to himself as doctor. 
and under such circumstances, why he probably pictures us having our little bout of love in the same strain. You're so lovely, Mary. Do let, do let me take off your pants. Oh, Dr. Blushing, you're so genteel and handsome. Can you beat it? I asked you as an old friend, the, the bumptious swine didn't even have enough delicacy in what he probably thought of as lovemaking to grant me intimacy to call him Jack or Harry or Percival or Happy Hooligan or whatever else he's named. <laughs> he's such an indescribable prig that he probably doesn't even allow himself to think of himself in terms of a first name. I just had time to get out of the get out the words, which must have come with something of a lip lip. Yes, you just wait until I call you. I'm ashamed to confess that they were almost lost in a burst of laughter. It wasn't ladylike at all the way I laughed. It was belly shaking laughter, hum a humoric laughter, Re <laughs> revelation laughter. Maybe I couldn't stop. Luke, the cook, came back in and asked what was the matter. I can't explain, I told her and went on laughing. What sort of people are you psychiatrists anyway? She now asked in her spirit arched way, again, enjoying her old friend's discomfiture, which was now almost lost in wonder and amusement. I bet that bat house tribador went away thinking that I had some historical with delight at the opportunity he offered. That might not be a absurd after all where am I at <sighs> that night that might not be absurd after all the friend murmured remembering the self-possession, the, the happy assured and happy assured will which doctor had emerged from the telephone booth that some that morning. This case is often for and it's finally done with it. This case is often for what it may be worth. No diagnosis of psychopathic personality has been made. Occasionally, news of him over the next few years indicated that he was still outwardly well adjusted. I believe it likely that he continues to prosper, and I have not the faintest notion that he will ever reach the wards of the psychiatric hospital except in the capacity of a physician and executive. So she's saying that he will never be a patient in a psychiatric hospital, but he will be the psychiatrist <laughs> or the executive. He does not really succeed in impressing people of discernment, though he continues to think he succeeds in this. He impresses many people who are themselves essentially undiscriminating. He cannot tell these from others with sonder judgments and regard himself as a great success socially as well as financially. Such a personality shows suggestions of an inner deviation quali qualitatively similar to what is found in the psychopath. The shrewdness is typical, unlike others such as Max, whose cleverness brings only momentary success in objective dealings with the world. This man's similar cleverness is applied with enough persistence for him to advance con continuously. He advances financially and within limits, even professionally. He is a smart fellow in a very superficial sense as a glib facility and medical activities. In relations with the public, he shows an excellent knack and artful sense of showmanship. For the more fundamental questions that immediately confront a person's interest in psychiatry, he apparently had no awareness and therefore no concern. The problem of life that makes up the chief and underlying interest for real psychiatrists do not exist for him. He is said to give many of his patients about what they feel they need. He is said to give many of his patients about what they feel and need with relatively uncomplex and emotionally shallow persons 
his amazing self-confidence is perhaps more quickly effective than the deeper understandings with its inevitable lack of certainties that another sort of this is when I get the words out, I'm like trying to push it out. <laughs> With relatively uncomplex and emotionally shallow persons, his amazing self-confidence is perhaps more quickly effective than the deeper understandings with its inevitable lack of certainties that another sort of man would bring to his work. His patients are reported to show improvements that compares favorably with that shown stop Cornier's take a break His patients are reported to show improvements that compares favorably with that shown by most of the patients treated by physicians whom aims are more serious. We must not forget that chiropractors quickly su succeed in revealing psychoneurotic patients of their symptoms by absurd measures. These practitioners, if they work in accordance with the fundamental principles of their craft, have no awareness of the real problem underlying such symptoms and no ability to help patients understand and deal with these problems. Such a man as this appears to be similarly limited. If one image imagine, I can't believe that the devil is attacking me in this video. God, I hope this is understandable to you guys. Please go buy this book. I'm sorry that I'm butchering this chapter. I can't stop my brain from messing up. It's unfortunate. <laughs> These practitioners, if they work in accordance with the fundamental principles of their craft, have no awareness of the real problems underlying such symptoms and no ability to help bleh, help patients understand and deal with these problems. Such a man as this appears to be similarly limited. If one imagines his attempting pertinent psych psychiatric study of a serious person, one whose words is quite foreign to him, the picture becomes farci farcical. This man then, the trait already mentioned notwithstanding, is who is one who, unlike the obvious psychopath, succeeds over many years in his outer adjustments. Granting the behavior described above is fairly typical and is persistent in the conclusion following that inwardly he is very poorly adjusted indeed. The qualities, damn, Cornelius. It would be advisable to just stop, right? Maybe it's my pride that's making me keep on going. I don't wanna make another video though. My brain don't want to continue. Can you imagine millions of people that the brain behaves this way? And the psychologists are wondering why people are upset right now. They're not helping us. I think we need to start coming against these psychologists and psychiatrists at this point.
This man then, the traits already mentioned notwithstanding, is one who, unlike the obvious psychopath, succeeds over many years in his outer adjustments. Granted that the behavior described above is fairly typical and is persistent in, the conclusion follows that the inwardly, he is very poorly adjusted indeed. The quality of happiness he knows and the degree of reality in which he experiences so much that is major in human relations are such that, despite his superficial success, he must fail to participate very richly in life itself. Let it be pointed out that the drunkenness, immature sex attitudes, the excrable taste, the deceits are not in themselves the basis for suspecting that this man is affected in some measure with the name, with the same disorder that affects the earlier cases. So they're not attributing this to the drunkenness, the immature sex, or the deceit are not in themselves the basis for suspecting that this man is affected in some measure. How is that not <laughs> the basis? <laughs> it has to be the behavior, right? Ooh. This is so fallible to say that this is not the basis. Or else what would you determine this then? His incompetence? Well, how can he, you determine incompetence where he's the executive of a psychiatric ward? <laughs> yeah. So you can kind of see all how psychology is all confusing. They're never going to get to the bottom line of these people because they don't want to look at the source of their dishonesties. It's coming from their denials. How do you not see drunkenness and all this promiscuous sex that he's having and all his deceitful nature and his erroneousness in this practice as being the basis for diagnosing him with psychopathic tendencies or even having a suspicion that he could be psychopathic? Uh, y'all are dishonest and y'all living in denial. That's why we need to go in and just do a whole revamp on this psychology field. All of this many readers would perhaps dismiss with the thought that our man might be more properly called a bad fellow and left it at that. No, we would call him crazy and insane and shouldn't be a member of this society running psychiatric wards. The significant points are, are these. His impulse to drink does not seem to be motivated by the hope of shared gaiety. All right, so this is what they're going to determine and how what's underlining the overt drunkenness, his immature sex attitudes, all of his taste and his deceit. They're going to go underneath all of this, but you've got to be able to go in and do, I guess, you got to know this person personally to be able to know underneath of what's really motivating this. His impulses to drink does not seem to be motivated by the, the hope of shared gaiety, but this is what we're seeing in his environment is a shared gaiety. Is this camaraderie and, and affability that he's showing to everybody? How is those impulses is not motivated by this gaiety? How are everybody in this bar or this party gonna understand that this is not common for him wanting everybody to just be lively and raise the roof? His attitude and sexual aims is so self-centered as to give the impression that even when carrying out intercourse with women, he is essentially solitary, isolated, and evaluation so immature that what satisfaction he achieves must must lie in concepts of a phallic phallic damaging and despoiling of the female with simultaneous reassurances to puerile concepts of his own virility <laughs> what what is this made i'm gonna slow this down a little bit his impulse 
his attitudes and sexual aims is so self-centered as to give the impression that even when carrying out intercourse with women, he is essentially solitary. But how would you know that unless you was in the bedroom with him, watching him? Isolated and evaluation so immature that what satisfaction he achieves must lie in concepts of a phallic damaging and despoiling of the female with simultaneous reassurances to Period concepts of his own virility. And what does period mean? Okay, juvenile or childish concepts of his virility. So he says like a prepubescent kind of basic or primal idea about sexual intercourse and i guess the damaging of his penis and the despoiling of her is i guess more related to his puritanical ideas about sex and intercourse or infidelity or fornication but when he's having his sex he's completely solitary and isolated in these premature infantile <laughs> uh, thoughts that he's having about sex and his engagement in this sex. And he's reassuring himself of this childish concept of his virility in this act as he's despoiling her. He's thinking in his mind, oh, I'm really doing this damage, right? <laughs> and she's like, a little to the left. <laughs> yeah. Phallic damaging. Yeah, you're only being damaged, buddy, and your ego and your pride, along with your phallus, is shriveling up. You need some motivation. You need some inspiration. <laughs> you want to go to the bathroom and wait? <laughs> As he's in the bathroom having a panic attack, <laughs> looking at his all shriveled up phallus. She damaged me. Such confusing and fragmentary achievements. <laughs> Common enough in a groping boy of 13 is a poor and pathologic substitute for fulfillment compatible with deep personality integration and inadequate for one even remotely as near adult as what is implied by this man's outer surface. This is so important of what he's saying. These fragmentary achievements of his endowment of his puerile or childish virility is common enough in a groping boy of 13 but it's a poor and pathologic substitute for the real fulfillment compatible with deep personality integration of him being aware that he's really just an emasculated, impotent boy, child. And he ain't doing no damage in the bedroom <laughs> as she as she's now in the bathroom pulling out her dildo, her, 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 her tickle me dildo. And he's hearing it in there. Honey, you okay in there? And he hearing that noise. Yeah, I'll be out in a second. <laughs> I thought we agreed we would bring out uh, Roger Rabbit. <laughs> As he's storming back to the bed, shriveled. This is pathologic substitute for fulfillment compatible with deep personality integration. So he can't integrate anything. He can't love her. He can't satisfy her sexually. And he doesn't understand why this is frustrating her. So no personality integration. But because he feels like that 
she, I guess, is compliant to the sex, that this is some sort of leeway or everything else can just be kind of uh, assuaged uh, about why he's, he's not satisfying her. Because we still together, right? If she was so unhappy, why she still with me? No, you don't understand the woman. Biologically, when she's attached to you, she she's devoted to you, no matter how sorry and pathetic you are. We clearly see this all out in our environments as you're not satisfying your woman. And when was the last time you gave her an anal or clitoral orgasm? You don't care, do you? Because you ain't got no personality integration into what that damage is doing to your wife. You can't satisfy no area emotionally or physically. And you don't care about that, do you, as you're still fornicating out on her. Your childish purial virility doesn't substitute for this inadequacy. I want you to know this psychopath. I'm not talking to you directly. There's no fulfillment compatible with this deep personality integration that you should be having for your wife now that she's in her bathroom frustrated with this sex toy. But you won't even give her a uh, head. Because you think it's it's falling outside your religious, I guess, beliefs. These are the Muslims. <laughs> but they constantly won't hear from their wife, but they won't reciprocate. Aren't y'all frustrated with that? No personality integration. And to understand why you also need this reciprocity as well. And it's inadequate for one even remotely as near adult as what is implied by this man's outer surface of having this high titles. He's the psychiatrist, right? He's supposed to be competent in the bedroom as well, right? This None of this will be questioned by these men as he's experiencing his impotence. So that's why I say we got to get out of our denials of all the real true reality of y'all pathetic lives. Because it's all pathologic. The confusion and pathologic reaction so well brought out by Carl Menninger in The Love Against Hate seems to imply here and to account satisfactorily for what may be important causal factors in the development of attitudes and maladaptations of this sort. His lack of taste and judgment in human relations seemed inconsistent with his opportunity to learn and with his ability to learn in other modes of knowing where such values and meanings do not enter. <laughs> like his sex with the Negro woman that's 200 pounds laying there. <laughs> his apparent hypocrisy is probably not a conscious element of behavior. But how are we going to know that <laughs> as he's coming and busting his nut? on this 200 pound Negro woman in the brothel. How we know it's not a conscious element of his behavior because he's competent. And we're supposed to think that competent psychiatrists <laughs> wouldn't make these type of injudious acts against their own values and ethical, more ethical values, right? But no, we are dealing with psychopaths out here. At least he is unaware of how it would seem to others even if he assumes all the facts were known to them. He just has a black woman fetish. <laughs> he has pent up rage and anger and guilt for himself because he can't satisfy his wife, right? So that guilt is going to turn into him now projecting it onto this nigger woman. He can expel all these confusing anxieties onto her now. Now he has psychological balance. This is where we're not getting that as these psychiatrists, these students are pulling him off of this woman. He's at least unaware of how it would seem to others. <laughs> he doesn't care about what they're thinking about him. Even if he assumed all the facts were known to them, <laughs> that he was just really feeling guilt for not being able to satisfy his wife and feeling impotent in this area. A whole misconstrued idea about his own virility. This is what they don't understand or not assuming that these are the facts that really has now propelled him to be with this 200-pound Negro woman. 
it has perhaps never occurred to him that there might be people in the world who have other fundamental aims than his own dominant aim to drop the disguise in which he has acted his part, perhaps not too com comfortably during the week, and splurged into what I would call actively more representative of disintegrative drives. He called it a disintegrative drive of aims at sharp variance with everything his outer self seems to represent. Failure, self-hatred in himself. These are the outer things, evidences of what, he, what these variants of his everything that his outer self seems to be representing as he's been with these Negro women and being speaking so injuriously to these colleagues, drinking to satiety. All of these behaviors plunges us into what I would call actively more representative of a disintegrative drive. So this is a propulsion that's unconscious. It's disintegrative because he doesn't understand or can take in what this is, how it's affecting other people, how he's offending other people, how he's objectifying, degrading women by being with uh, harlots and Negro women when he don't really uh, see them as his equal. These are disintegrative drives in himself of aims at sharp variances with everything that outer self seems to represent. So y'all can apply that to everything now. Shift this over to what now <laughs> these variances of these drives that are disintegrative in you. How is this representing these outer representations of who you really are and how your behavior is. I don't know, I'm getting confused, but I'm just taking my time with this last piece because this is very important. I am well aware that many basic impulses appear to in forms not socially acceptable, that they might be called immoral, vulgar, criminal, or by other unpleasant words. The person here discussed when seen without his mask seems not to be directed in any consistent or propulsive scheme by these socially unacceptable tendencies. So he seems not to be directed in any consistent and propulsive scheme by these socially unacceptable tendencies, but largely to blunder about at their behest. In his outer front, he functions in accordance with all the proprieties, large and small, but here the reality is thin and personal anticipation half-hearted. He is somewhat like a small boy who succeeds in maintaining a decorum and even getting a good mark on conduct while in the schoolroom under teacher's watchful eye. Though he looks attentive, he is only shrewdly compromising, biding his time to get at what he is to him more important. When the bell rings and he escapes from what he finds to be an artificial situation, an area of formalities and polite pretenses, he becomes natural and plays in accordance to what he takes to be the actual rules and real aims of existence, sex at all costs. The small schoolboys learn eventually to reconcile what the classroom represents and what he sought in his hours of play. He finds in his work responsibilities, ways of celebrating, etc. Much that is compatible, a core at least, that he can integrate into constructive self-fulfilling and on the whole, harmonious expressions of basic impulses. So now he's on Pornhub at his office, taking one for the team. <laughs> In such a man as the one we are considering, little harmony of this sort appears. 
Unlike those represented as clinical psychopaths, he has learned to carry out the formalities rather consistently and appears as actually living in constructive and socially adaptive patterns, thanks to his privilege. They can I can't mask it around privilege and, and higher mobility and middle class living. They just it's a mask. It's an adaptive pattern of sociability, and we don't question them, right? Actually, this is a surface activity that they're getting away with out here. A sort of ritual in which not much of himself enters into the scheme of things. Which is why we don't understand why what, what why people really think about racism as we're seeing these racial structures feel still being in place. It's a surface activity of tolerance, of democracy acceptance and things like this. A sort of ritual in which not much of himself will enter. So we don't get the real truth or the transparency, right? To get the emotional integration of we're alike, we're equal. We have the same objectives and motives. This will never happen because this is all surface activities that they've given away with. These adapt socially adapted patterns of behavior, of being like and all they have to do is just not deviate from this behavior. This is the sorcery right here, guys. Actually, this is a surface activity, a sort of ritual in which not much of himself enters. For his more natural and inwardly accepted impulses, he has found nothing reconcilable with what he gives lip service to and must turn to patterns of behavior so immature, that's the regression, and subjectively chaotic that they mock and deny all that his surface affirms that I have grace by God, that I'm favored by God, that divine providence fell on my race, that I can claim white superiority. But his regressive behavior and patterns of behavior will prove that this immature and subjectively chaotic chaoticness, <laughs> it's just a mock to deny all that is what's on the surface is affirming that you really live in guilt and shame to why you have these fetishes and erotic desires that you are compulsive and propulsive and unconscious in you. So you figure I'm just going to have adapted patterns of, of a surface activity showing people that I'm tolerant, that I'm unbothered and I'm just going to be disassociated all the while I still love you. I accept you. And I don't have no gripe or, or nothing against you. All the while being in my secret fraternities uh, and Freemason groups doing alchemy and, and magic and things and being a part of these groups doing rituals to keep y'all keep y'all energetically uh, channeling energies and ciphering energies from other high vibrational beings. Y'all doing that as well on y'all computers in these coffee shops. So Obviously, this is going to show an outward manifestation of pattern of behavior that's going to be regressive or immature or subjectively chaotic in y'all behavioral patterns. It's all lip service of y'all, which y'all accept and really like and really want to, to see uh, developed in our society, which is progress, right? No, I'm just applying this to other aspects of the hypocrisies. This is all psychopathy, which is what I've been all knowing. The outer layers of socially acceptable functionings, which is what it all is, extends little deeper into effect than any other exercise empty of all but formality. That's all it is, just a bunch of formalities as she's giving you the coaxing smile. As you're giving her the compliment, I love your hair. Say nothing in turn and, and go and waiting on her food as I'm waiting there, like, what just happened? And then she turns around and said, thanks. And he turns back around, maintaining the smile. These are the psychopaths that I'm witnessing every single day. Is there something going on behind? What is this, a veil? What is this? This is our show of formalities that you're just showing that. I really don't like you. 
but I'm gonna show it just by just being this way, by just giving you a coaxing smile and a shrewd tone. Thank you. No, she didn't even say thank you. She just a smile. She just turned around. First it was ignore. It was a smile as if she was coaxing me. Oh, look at the little child as she's petting me steadily on the on the head. <laughs> Job well done. Good observation. Yeah, I use Garnier Fruitis. <laughs> and what I, my response when she finally did turn back around, recognizing that I recognized her mental disorder, she wanted to play it off and, and by turning back around to acknowledge me now. But she didn't say anything, all while maintaining that true sarcastic look on her face and I thought it's all you it's your hair you did a good job with it bravo <laughs> I'm not doing this for me <laughs> so you can say oh thank you and then I can feel gratified and I can go about my day feeling so good about myself <laughs> I got somebody to I got some white woman to feel uh to gratify me by saying thank you wow so this is how I have high self-esteem by complimenting white people. I'll learn this in my environment as they give me the formalities of job well done. Good observation. Come on in here in this five-star restaurant. You're acceptable now. She did have some pretty hair, though. I didn't want her hair. I don't know what was that whole attitude was about, but I don't know if she thought I was envious or covetous of her hair. She couldn't accept that compliment. It said more about her than me, that she had to do this whole scene to show that she was more better than me or superior than me. But it's all in her own mind. It's just an hour show of formalities. It's social acceptable functionings that she's realized. If I just smile, then he won't think that I'm really a psychopath, autistic, schizophrenic. The outer layers of social acceptable functioning extends a little deeper into effect that than any other exercise empty of all but formality. He has apparently learned to carry out a lip service in matters that he finds unreal and tedious and to take pride in how well this is performed. The inner man, as an alternative to the barren channels of formality, finds for the more valid fulfillment of real impulse only pathways or outlets which branch off in sharp deviations. Obviously, there's going to be a regression from the surface channels, which cannot in any way be integrated with those and which in themselves remain relatively archaic. This is why the trans woman has now become an artifact because these are just archaic, archaic in his mind, but they're not integrated within themselves. So there's a deviation from the surface channels of now maintaining morality, heteronormativity. But it cannot be in any way integrated into those in which in themselves remain relatively archaic. Now I'm an alpha. That's the archaic in his mind. So now I have to control how he now he's de, 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 de deviated by trying to control the trans girl without looking at the outer surface of how this is not seeing it as just a social adaptability of formalities to only accommodate uh, and to match with his maladaption. It's only working in compartment with his maladaptions is what I'm saying of this new life that he's now created to match this sort of style of life to this now deviation a regression. And then he gives lip service about his masculinity by calling themselves heterosexual and an alpha and he likes femininity as if he's not feminine himself. 
and don't like to be dominated. <laughs> but these patterns of behavior are all immature and subjective and chaotic in his own mind. And it mocks and denies at the surface that is being affirmed as we're seeing him on Pornhub getting digged down by these trans girls and sucking dick at the same time. Though he can actually do that at the same time. I can't even do that as a gay man physically. I'm not that talented. <laughs> I'm not that talented. How you can you concentrate to be taking dick and sucking at the same time? So y'all get good at this as well. So this mocks at the surface that is affirming y'all digression, y'all emasculations, these patterns of behavior. And then y'all can just keep up an hour show of social formalities as long as I just look the part. Nah. This is so dishonest. I don't know how I got on this topic. I just figured I just want to do it my way now so I can get my some energy back in here. I'm going to put some power into this. But I'm going to let this devil keep attacking me on this video. Uh, and I feel like I got my power back now. And I got my strength back. And this devil is not frustrating me now. Because I'm just doing it my way now. I'm just going to do it my way. Stop trying to look good for y'all. I don't care how y'all feel about me. I don't care about y'all judgments. If y'all think I can read, if I'm smart enough to read and read that teach this book, who cares? I'm showing y'all what this what this psychopath is about. This is stuff that psychologists don't talk about. They don't talk about this in relationships, marriage counseling, things like this. These underlining hidden contents of this psychopath, the ideations. I want y'all to pay attention to. These are socially acceptable functionings that they've been getting away with. But it doesn't, but all it does is mock and deny at the surface that is affirming their these patterns of behavior that are not integrated in themselves. Is what I'm trying to get y'all. So they keep up outward shows of formalities rather than consistently appearing to be the alpha men that they were claiming to be. It doesn't that doesn't translate into their behaviors. So this is dis integrative drives in themselves are these aims for them to seek out this behavior but it's a regression in themselves it's an immature and subjective chaos that is only mocking and denying all that his surface is affirming that he's a masculine alpha male who was heterosexual and moral and righteous the outer layers of social acceptable functioning extends little deeper into the effect than any other exercise empty of all but formality. He has apparently learned to carry out a lip service in matters that he finds unreal and tedious and to take pride in how well this is performed. The inner man, as an alternative to the barren channels of formality, finds for the more valid fulfillment of real impulses only pathways or outlets which branch off in sharp deviation from the surface channels which cannot in any way be integrated with those and in which in themselves remain relatively archaic because they can't fit trans attraction into the moral piece this is how why it can be integrated so it becomes archaic in his mind. So she just becomes an artifact, poorly organized in any common direction or toward any mature goal, which is why he can't establish her in his life. More or less chaotic is what it becomes. And socially regressive or self-destructive, which it has shown to be in our society. I love this psychology. You can't get away from it. But all you can do is sit and live in denial of it. But it's not going to change it metaphysically. Yeah. So this is finally the last page. Uh, guys, I'm sorry it took me nearly two hours to get through this. But I guess Spirit wanted me to do this this way. It is only confusing to interpret such a personality in terms of bad or good. This is straight up evil. From a psychiatric viewpoint, at least, such aspects of a maladjusted human beings are uninspiring. 
Years after the incident recorded in this report, some news of the good doctor was received, which I believe would stand as paradox in paradise. <laughs> it was brought to the young psychiatrist who had accompanied doctor during the spree, just cited by it an earnest middle-aged lady with a strong penchant for talking about psychology and psychiatry and psychoanalysis analysis about anything containing the prefix psych for that matter. Striking at once for her hearer's closest interest, she began to talk about a wonderful lecture she had recently heard in a distant town at some woman's club or literary society which was fostering the cause of mental hygiene. The lecturer was marvelous, she insisted. He stirred up such enthusiasm that half the ladies present had begun to study psychology. At his subjects, he talked about the queerest people. They were not exactly insane, but they really did the most fantastic things. They were even harder to understand than lunatic themselves. But the lecturer understood them, though he confessed in all modesty, that some points about them were a puzzle, even to the one of his own experiences. He was the most impressive person, so poised and authoritative, yet always quite quiet spoken. He was such an intellectual person, a man of wide and profound culture, and such a gentleman. And quote, I declare, I believe half of the women in our club wished that they could exchange roles with his wife, with all <laughs> that grasp of psychology, just imagine what a husband he must be, end quote. This is what she was thinking about him. <laughs> Girl, you're in for a surprise. <laughs> she would like to learn more about these people, psychopathic personalities, or psychopaths, the doctor had called them. And the doctor's name, she uttered it in hushed tone of admiration. <laughs> and that's the end of this part. And then we're going to the section three of cataloging the material, which I will not do. I think this is going to be the end of this book of me reading this book. I'm going to just jump over into something else in another interest. I've devoted 10 days to this, a whole week to this book. So y'all understand that what we're dealing with psychopaths as a psychiatrist. I'm not going to read psychopath as a scientist. I don't think it's necessary. Uh, and there's also another one that I'm not going to read is the psychopath as a physician. Uh, I did enough and I put, exerted enough energy today with the psychiatrist. Guys, go out there and pick your mental health professionals wisely and discerningly. Most of them are psychopaths. They're in all vessels, female and male, and they're looking at you with a blank face, uh, billing your insurance and giving you and giving you valuable care. And you're not getting any help in getting to the root of your problems. And start calling these people out because they don't got our best interests at heart and they're working for the devil. Hey, God loves you and I love you. Sorry about all the dramatics today. I hope it kept you entertained as we're learning about psychopathy um, because we have them out there every day. Ciao.